So I have about 30 seconds and then I will, uh, then I'll mute everybody. And, Okay, unmute yourselves and go. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Robert. Uh, so welcome to the second talk of today. I want to make one announcement in case you missed it. We had a slight change of schedule uh, because Andy is not available. Um, actually, Greg Moore uh, was kind enough to step in. And so he'll actually speak tomorrow at 11 o'clock or uh, four o'clock GMT. And this evening, instead of Andy's talk, we'll have Tom Bridgeland's second lecture. So today at 8 p.m., 3 p.m., it's Tom number two, and tomorrow the first session will be by Greg Moore, and then we continue uh, as planned. Okay, great. So the second talk of today is by Marcos Mourinho from the University of Geneva, and he'll talk about resurgence from resurgence to topological strings. So Marcos, take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very glad to be able to speak in this workshop. So I will uh, try to give some ideas on resurgence from the kind of more physical point of view, but uh, with applications to mathematics. So, so what do we, why do we do uh, resurgence? Well, actually, resurgence, the starting point of resurgence is perturbation theory. And this is an important starting point because perturbation theory with a small parameter is one of the few universal techniques we have in physics to actually solve problems which we cannot solve exactly. And this is already something that our undergraduate students uh, are exposed to when they study quantum mechanics. So one typical uh, example of perturbation theory in quantum mechanics is the following. Suppose you have a harmonic oscillator, you have this Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator and you perturb it with a quartic term. When you do that, the model is no longer exactly solvable and analytically, uh, the best thing you can do, essentially, if you want to calculate the ground state energy of the system, is to do an asymptotic power series in this perturbation. Uh, uh, this is a perturbation x to the 4 with a coupling constant g. So the best thing you can do is a perturbation uh, for a small values of g. And this produces a perturbative series uh, in g with a formal power series with infinite terms. And this is what we teach our undergrad to calculate. Now, unfortunately, for our undergrad undergraduates, this perturbative series is actually uh, not convergent, has zero radius of convergence, and it has to be handled very carefully. And the reason is that uh, when you look at the coefficients of the series, you will see that uh, they grow factorially. This can be actually established uh, uh, rigorously. And, uh, also, unfortunately for us, this is not uh, just a kind of exotic example, it's the norm. Perturbative series in quantum field theory have generically zero radius of convergence. So they do not really define functions or at least, uh, at least on, on your nose. So you have to do something about it. And physicists and mathematicians have developed uh, various tricks to reconstruct the underlying function, which is behind a divergent series. And, and this is something that you have to do uh, because you see most of the most successful predictions of physics are based on divergent series, many of them. So for example, computations in the standard model of elementary particles, which we are all very proud of, are very often based on factorial divergent series. So this is something that you have to address at some point. Uh, one way to address this is to use all the technologies that Brent was also summarizing yesterday, which are techniques based on, on Borel resumation methods. So, in this talk, uh, I will actually try to give a more formal point of view on this. And as, as you will see, uh, the, the thing that I would want to really emphasize is how to use this uh, starting uh, divergent series as a way to uncover new sectors of a theory. Okay. So let me try to, to give you an idea of this. So, so let's suppose that you have a formal power series with factorially growing coefficients, like the ones that appear in quantum mechanics. So I'm going to denote this as phi of z, and this is a, a formal power series where a n grow factorially. Now, this uh, type of series are sometimes called Gevray one series. And uh, if you want to use these techniques of Borel uh, resumation, the first step 
is not actually the resumation, but uh, what uh, uh, is called a Borel transform. Um, this is a very simple way of transforming a series like this into a nice function. And it's actually very, very trivial. So what you do is you just uh, from the original formal power series, which has zero radius, of, zero radius of convergence, you create another object, which is another series, which I call uh, hat phi of a different variable zeta. And this uh, series is uh, obtained by just dividing all these coefficients by n factorial. And in this way, you create a series which typically grows only exponentially and will have a finite radius of convergence. Now, in particular, this series is going to be analytic at the origin. And uh, this is the first step of Borel resumation. But uh, in this talk, I will try to use Borel resumation at the minimum. So let's, let's try to actually understand what happens with the Borel transform. So as Brent was also explaining yesterday, sometimes you are lucky. And this function, which is analytic at the origin of the complex plane, can be analytically continued, except for a finite number of singularities. Uh, when this happens, we say that this function is resurgent. Now, these singularities, which are in this variable zeta that I introduced here, can be of all kinds, can be poles or branch cuts and so on. And I will denote them often by this uh, uh, notation zeta of omega. So zeta of omega will denote generically singularities in the Borel plane uh, of this zeta variable. So, so you see, this is something uh, very simple, but very powerful because we have changes our, we have changed our point of view from the world of formal power series to the world of analytic functions at the origin. And this is a very important step because now what we can try to do is to understand what happens near these singularities. So in a sense, these singularities are, uh, you know, philosophically, they are the boundary of what you can actually understand with the original power series. So when you try to understand what happens to this Borel transform near these singularities, you're really pushing perturbation theory to its limits. But this, we can do it in the context of, of complex analysis, very simple, in a very simple way. So uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, talk, I will actually suppose that these singularities are just uh, logarithmic branch cut singularities. And the resurgent functions that satisfy these are called simple resurgent functions. All the examples I will actually look at in this talk are of, are of this type. This can be easily generalized for more general branch cuts and so on. So let's suppose then that we look at this Borel transform near a, log a logarithmic singularity. What we will find if we do this? Well, we will find a log. The logarithmic singularity is located at this, at this point zeta of omega in the Borel plane. You will have a log. And multiplying this log, you will have an analytic function. And if you normalize appropriately this analytic function, you choose a normalization, it's also uh, hopeful, uh, useful to introduce a, a constant and a proportionality constant here, which will be called a Stokes constant. Now, this is an analytic function. Well, we can think about it as the Borel transform of another function which diverges factorially. So the coefficients of this function which multiplies the log are going to grow exponentially, but you multiply them by n factorial, they're going to grow factorial again. And you see that in a sense, what we are doing is from the original perturbative series, by looking at what happens near the singularities of this world transform, we are able to produce new series, which are also factorial divergent. And this is actually a way to uncover new sectors of the theory, which are not manifest in your original starting point, which is a simple perturbative series. So from the perturbative series, through the singularities of its world transform, you actually have access to other power series, which are going to actually be related to non-perturbative sectors of the theory in, in physical parlance. And I will give you some examples of this in increasing order of complexity in this talk. But this is the basic, the, you, you can see that resurgence is not only a way to resum series, but also to discover new sectors of a theory. And this is, for me, is going to be very important. Uh, now, once you have obtained all these new, uh, uh, new series here, you can repeat the procedure again, and then you can look at the singularities of these new, uh, of these new series. You can just, uh, if you want to look at the singularities of these Borel transforms, and then you will start a procedure in which you will uncover more and more formal power series, more and more new sectors. And at some point, 
this procedure finishes, and you will end up with a set of formal power series, which I will label by a, a label omega, and a matrix of Stokes constants. Remember that once you have chosen a normalization for all these series, uh, in this analysis, you will find constants relating them, and these constants are called Stokes constants. So in a sense, uh, behind a simple perturbative series, you will find all this structure in which you have additional formal power series related by looking at the singularities of the Rebola transforms, and there will be a matrix S omega omega prime relating these uh, power series. And uh, these more general power series, I will refer to them uh, as trans series. Uh, Brent was introducing this uh, formal concept yesterday. Uh, and once you have uh, a, this collection of, of series, you can actually use Borel resumation to reconstruct uh, actual functions. Uh, but I, as I said, I, I will not focus on that, on that aspect today. Uh, uh, today, I want, I want to really emphasize more this aspect of uh, discovering new sectors and finding this structure of a family of formal power series under those constants. Now, uh, I want to give you uh, as I said before, an increasing, uh, an increasing order, or an increasing level of complexity in the examples. So let me start with a very, very elementary example that you could find uh, in any book on special functions. So when you want to understand the asymptotics of AD functions, you eventually find a formal power series that I wrote up here, uh, uh, which actually grows uh, like uh, factorial. Its coefficients grow factorially. You see, you have uh, two gammas in the in the numerator and one gamma in the denominator. So this grows like n factorial. And this is a very nice example because in this case you can actually calculate the Borel transform very simply. It's actually it's easy to see that this is going to give you a hypergeometric function. Uh, so there should be a hat here. Sorry, this is the Borel transform. So I have to divide by an additional n factorial. When you do that. You find a hypergeometric function, which indeed has a finite radius of convergence. So it's, it's converging at the origin with a finite radius of convergence. And uh, the first, uh, the only singularity that you find is a log singularity along the negative real axis. So this is exactly an example of what we would call a simple resurgent function. This power series here is a very simple example of a simple resurgent function. Uh, now, the idea of resurgence then. One of the ideas of resurgence is that if you explore the, uh, exp the, uh, the local behavior of the Borel transform near the singularity, you will find something else. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that if you do this, you actually find something else. It's very easy to find using elementary properties of hypergeometric functions that if you expand the Borel transform, this hypergeometric function around the singularity, you will find a log singularity times another formal power series. Uh, the associated divergent formal power series that you obtain is actually the same uh, power series that we obtained before, but with a different sign here. And this is actually very interesting because this is, in a sense, the other formal power series solution that appears when you study AD function. So, for example, you want to reconstruct the other AD function BI, you will have to use also this formal power series. So, you see that we started with one object, but by looking at these singularities, we find a different object, which is in this case close related to it, but it's different. And in this case, you can see that with these normalizations, the Stokes constants are very simple. They are just one. Uh, so I hope uh, this um, clarifies a little bit the mechanism. Uh, and the question you could ask now that you have seen how this example works is how this would work for a kind of more complicated theory, right? For um, a more, uh, uh, for example, for the formal power series that one finds in physical theories. Now, let me point out. Marco, Marcos. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, yeah. um, so you didn't try to tell us about this normalization. So you're defining things, Stokes factors are defined up to some overall normalization or? Yeah, yeah, but you notice something that, you know, precisely because these, these two objects are related through, through by looking at this singularity. And now when you look at the singularity of this, function, uh, you will also find the first function. When you look at the singularity of this function, you will find the, you will find the first function. Uh, so these constants are actually uh, are actually well-defined because if you rescale any of these things, uh, you know, you will actually, uh, you, you, you know, the, these numbers are actually unchanged, okay? You see, uh, the, here, here in this 
in this uh, definition of the, the Stokes constant is, is is relating the singularity. So if you fix uh, if you change the, the if you change the 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 normalization of of one of these functions, uh, you you will actually uh, change the Stokes constant. But uh, but uh, then the Stokes constant will also uh, I mean. If you well, in this the, equation, you have an yes. s omega, not an yes. s omega, omega prime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you do, if you now take a, a family of functions f omega, and you, you know, and this, uh, and, and you have this matrix relating, then you can see that if you just change the normalization of these f omegas by the same number, you know, uh, you know, this won't, will be unchanged, right? Because this is relating the different phi omegas, right? So, is is this? Is this clear or? Sort of. Okay. I mean, I mean, some of these, some of these stones constants, you cannot really change them because you know they are relating these two things. So, so uh, once you, you choose a normalization, so say for phi one, you know, then you know the whole thing will follow through. Okay. Now, in order to kind of motivate what happens with the with, in physics, let me point out that. Um, as you can see, the AD functions can also be interpreted as as, as saddle point uh, formal power series related to to one to one dimensional integrals. So one typical example of, of these one dimensional integrals are the kind of integrals you can study with the saddle point. So these are one dimensional integrals in which you have an exponential of a function divided by a small coupling constant like h bar. And Typically, you can produce formal power series by doing a saddle point expansion of these integrals. And here I'm not specifying any contour because I just want to find formal power series solutions. So you just have to expand this integral around saddle points. So if you consider if, if this is the shape of this function x of x, different saddle points will give you different uh, expansions. So the, the typical structure of expansion is the following. You have a small exponential with the value of this function at the critical point multiplied by a, a kind of Gaussian factor, and then you will be, you will have a power from a formal power series in each bar. And each critical point will give you a saddle point expansion like this. And of course, these two formal power series that we obtain in the area example can actually be obtained in this way by using the integral uh, solution representation of the area equation, for example. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, you, you find from this uh, resurgent uh, analysis is that each of these saddle points will actually see each other through the singularities of the Boyle transform. This is in a sense also what we found in this, uh, in, this, um, in this area example analysis, in which by looking at the behavior of this singularity of phi one, we, have, we found this phi two. And you can also see that if you look at the singularity behavior of phi two, you find phi one. So these two series are related through the singularities of the Boyle transform. Now, if you have uh, a saddle point uh, analysis of an integral in which you have two saddle points, what you will find when you do the analysis of this Borel transform is that the Borel transform of the first series will have a singularity at a point in the complex plane, which is given by the difference of actions uh, of the two series that appear here. So you will have the singularity here will be located at the value of this function at the second point minus the value of the function at the first point. And conversely, if you look at the Borel transform of the second series, you will find a singularity at uh, the opposite point, s x s one minus x s one x two. Okay, so this is a typical uh, structure that you find in, in in this saddle point analysis, and this is a very simple example in which you actually see that the Borel transform tells you about the systems of other of other sectors, which in this case are related to different critical points of the same function. So, so if you want to think about how to do resurgence in physics. You could actually use uh, this analogy in order to think about the production of this formal power series. Now, in physics, very often we we have uh, our uh, our observables are defined by path integrals, and you can think about the path integrals as generalized uh, one-dimensional integrals in which you can do some sort of uh, saddle point analysis. So typically, you will have a formal path integral of this form, in which you have an action which depends on a field phi of x, and you have an h-bar constant which appear also in the action, in front of the action. 
And then you can uh, think about the critical points of this uh, action as giving you different starting points for different expansions. And the formal power series that you obtain in this way would be just obtained by doing asymptotic expansions around different critical points. And these are expansions around instantons in quantum theory, quantum mechanics or in quantum field theory. So in principle, the production of these formal power series and different sectors it should be not very difficult to do because we have uh, developed techniques in physics to actually do this formal power series expansion of path integrals. And we know how to study instantons and we know how to study formal power series around these instantons. But what is not obvious is how to actually construct the whole structure of, of this series and in particular, how to calculate the Stokes constant that relates them. This is a much more complicated problem because it's very hard in physics to, for example, produce formal power series to all orders in order to actually have a good idea of how, what's the distribution of singularities of the regular transforms. Now, if you want to actually follow this program in quantum field theory, it's advisable to start with very simple examples. And the best class of examples are actually um, examples in which uh, uh, path integrals reduce in some way to ordinary integrals. And this happens in es essentially in two types of theories, in topological field theories, and in supersymmetric, in supersymmetric theories. And this gives some of the best uh, studied examples of resurgence in quantum field theory. So what I'm going to, to do now is to give you an example of resurgence, which we work out very recently in, in, in complex John Simon's theory, which is in a sense, a kind of natural generalization of this uh, one dimensional example of the AD function that I was giving you. As you will see, it has an interesting twist that makes contact, makes contact with more, um, interesting mathematical structures. So what is this example of complex John Simon's theory? Well, as many of you I think know very well, uh, there is a quantum field theory called John Simon's theory, which was introduced by Witten, uh, like uh, in 1989. And in this theory, essentially um, physical quantities, like for example, partition functions, path integrals, compute invariance of three manifolds. Now, the original theory of, of, of Witten was introduced for compact gauge groups, but it was uh, realized by Witten himself and then developed by many other people, in particular by Sergei Gukov. They actually uh, uh, realized that you could actually enrich the theory by considering Chern Simon's uh, theory for a complex gauge group. Now, uh, here I'm, I'm a little bit sloppy, I'm not writing things very precisely, but um, uh, essentially you have the churn simons functional of a gauge connection A, you can define a partition function by doing this path integral. Now here, you see the role of tau, of, of H bar, sorry, is played by tau. And in the case in which uh, you take a complex uh, gauge group, uh, tau is naturally a complex coupling constant. So uh, tau is, plays the role of H bar, but natural is a, a complex ca coupling constant. And you can actually see that the theory is well defined if tau is a complex number, which is non-negative. Now in this, uh, in this example, I will focus on, on the simplest case, which is the complex gauge group uh, SL2C. And this defines uh, invariance, uh, this complex turn simons theory defines invariance of the manifold M in which you have defined this turn simons theory, uh, which are functions of this coupling constant tau. Now, when can we solve this path integral? Well, as Witten solved in his original work, when you have a compact gauge group, you can actually reduce this path integral to a finite sum. Now, when the gauge group is complex, this is slightly more complicated, but in many cases, you can actually reduce the path integral to a finite dimensional integral, which is sometimes called a state integral. In particular, you can do that in the very important case in which M is the complement of a hyperbolic knot in the three sphere. So it has been argued by many people, both in physics and in mathematics, that in this case, this partition function produced to a multidimensional um, uh, integral, which is roughly of the form that appears in any saddle point expression. So it's going to be a function of tau, but it's just given by an integral uh, which, in which you have uh, the sort of action, which depends on, on, on some finite, finite uh, variables x and of a coupling constant tau. And this is itself divided by tau. So the only complication here is that this function itself depends on tau. And for those of you who are experts on the field, this is a slightly simplified version of the theory because the theory actually depends on a modulus, which uh, it's essentially um, a Wilson line 
uh, when you when you have when you are working on the complement of a hyperbolic node, the theory depends on addition of Wilson line, which I'm setting here to be zero or one, depending on your normalization. So the theory allows a deformation by by a, a complex parameter, uh, which I'm setting here to a very specific value. This is just to simplify the story. You can generalize the story to this more general case. Sorry, can you say what this? Excuse me. Can you say what the finite dimensional space is you are integrating over? Well, that depends on the knot you are considering. Right. Okay, so so you know, in order to define this, you have to find a you have to do a you have to do a triangulation of of the complement of the knot, and then the number of variables essentially depends on the number of 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 of, of, of hyperbolic angles in this triangulation, and then you integrate over those. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is the theory of the states integrals that you are doing here. But at the end of the day, you have just a conventional uh, mm, finite dimensional integral. So for example, in the example I will consider, this is actually a one dimensional integral. And you could think that you can use all these techniques that you use in standard saddle point analysis. Like for example, you would do for the AD function, okay? So, so uh, if you look at, this, at the saddle points of this finite dimensional integral, uh, of course, they have to be related to what you would call instantons in complex chain Simon's theory. Now, instantons in complex chain Simon's theory are flat complex connections on the manifold M. Mm -hmm. uh, when you expand this state integral around these points, you expect to have the general structure of, of, of one of these expansions. So what you expect to have is an exponential term, which essentially is the evaluation of the classical action at this flat complex connection divided by the coupling constant tau times a formal power of series in the complex complex constant tau, which it's given in this way. So notice that for each flat complex connection, you will have a different expansion. Um, this uh, expansion is going to involve uh, um, uh, coefficients, which actually diverge factorial. Again, you see this is the kind of uh, uh, typical generic uh, situation in any quantum theory your perturbative series will diverge factorial. Now, uh, when you look at the geometry of these flat complex connections, you realize that when you are considering the, the complement of hyperbolic node, you realize that there is always a very, uh, uh, a very specific uh, important connection, which is called sometimes the geometric connection, which corresponds to the geodesically complete hyperbolic metric on the complement of the hyperbolic node. And then since we are doing a complex term sign theory, there will be its conjugate. And then the real value of the action mm, that appears here in this evaluation is going to be for the geometric connection and its conjugate is going to be plus minus respectively the hyperbolic volume of the knot. So you see, uh, you are doing a compression Simon's theory in the complement of hyperbolic knot. And when you do perturbation theory, you will actually discover classical invariants of this hyperbolic knot. And the first thing you will discover is this hyperbolic volume. Okay? So this, that's actually very natural from the point of view of, of, of this quantum field theory. Uh, so what is interesting here is that you are actually finding, uh, seeing any quantum theory, these factorial divergence series. And now you can ask yourself, what do you expect for the resurgent structure of this series? So what, is, what do you expect for them? Uh, so in order to answer this question, let me focus in a simplest example that you can have, which is, of course, the simplest hyperbolic knot. And this is this figure A knot that I show here. And uh, this uh, figure A knot is particularly simple because in this case, there are only two uh, flat connections associated to, to this knot, which are exactly the geometric connection and its conjugate. Okay, so in this case, you only have two critical points for this theory, and you will have, co co corresponding to them, you will have two different power series uh, which I'm going to call phi g and phi c again. So these are the complex, uh, these are, these are the, the perturbative series associated to the expansions of this integral around these critical points. Now, naively, since there are only two critical points, you would expect that the Borel transforms of this series would only give you two singularities, like it happens in the AD function, right? Or like it happens in this example that I was showing you here. You would expect that each of these power series would have one simple singularity in this Borel transform, which corresponds to the other critical point. Remember that through the Borel transform, each series sees the other critical point. But it turns out that there is a very interesting twist in this story, and this is the first complication that you find in a sense. And this is related to the fact that the complex chain turns out to be multivalued. 
And this has the surprising consequence that when you look at the Borel transform of this power series, you actually find not just one singularity, but you find an two towers, two infinite towers of singularities in the complex plane. So if there was, if, if, let's consider, for example, the expansion of, around the geometric connection, which is a very canonical object in a hyperbolic geometry. This actually corresponds to the asymptotic expansion of the Jones polynomial. And so this is related to the famous volume conjecture. So if you were looking at the singularity of this formal power series in the complex plane, you would expect just to see one singularity corresponding to the conjugate connection for this map. But then what you find is a tower of infinite uh, uh, singularities and which are separated by two pi. So this, you have some sort of periodic structure of, of singularities separated by two pi in the imaginary direction. And, and this uh, infinite number of singularities correspond to an infinite number of additional series, which turned out, turned out to be very simple. Uh, each tower corresponds to either the geometric or the conjugate connection just multiplied by an exponential factor. Okay? And this factor is, of course, reproducing you know, this uh, uh, periodic structure here. So that's a very simple twist to the story that you would find in the study of, say, the AD function. Uh, you see that this uh, additional series seem to be very simple because they are just obtained by the two main series that you obtain in the game by just some trivial factor. And then you could think that the Stokes constants associated to these uh, singularities are very simple. But it turns out that they are not very simple. Uh, it turns out that the Stokes constants associated to these uh, singularities can be uh, naturally, uh, again, uh, coming back to the question of Greg, you know, you can actually uh, find a, a natural normalization for this series in such a way that these are actually integer numbers. And then what you find is that this is those constants give you a new set of integer invariants for this hyperbolic knot. And uh, that's actually uh, very surprising because this series, phi g of tau and phi c of tau, these power series that you constructed are not uh, uh, made out of integers. I mean, they are actually uh, formal power series whose coefficients are essentially rational numbers, okay, up to, up to I mean, you, you, you find the square roots of, 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 of three, for example, in this example, and, and there is a quadratic field that appears here associated to the knot, but they are essentially rational numbers. Still, when you can calculate the Stokes constant, they turn out to be integer invariants. And what is more surprising is that some of these invariants are known to be related to BPS states, to, to be, are, are actually counting objects are counting BPS states in a physical theory. So, so this example, which is in a sense, one of the simplest examples you can find in physics, is already quite rich. You have an infinite number of singularities. Each of the singularities gives you an integer, those constants. And I think this corresponds very well to what Tom was saying yesterday. I mean, Tom was proposing that, you know, counting of BPS invariance should be associated to a Stokes problem. And this is, what you actually see in this example, because these numbers, at least uh, this uh, one of these towers here uh, can be directly related to the counting of BPS states um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, an, in a quantum field theory. And, and, but here in this example, they appear as Stokes constants for a very simple problem in resurgence. Uh, we have developed uh, in, in some detail the theory of this invariance in recent work with Stavros Galufarilis and Diego. And as I was saying, you know, that in some cases, some of these integers are related to BPS invariants through what is called the 3D 3D correspondence. So this theory is this topological quantum field theory associated to a node can be seen to uh, is a, can be seen to be equivalent uh, in, in a very precise sense to a supersymmetric ace theory in three dimensions in which you can formulate a problem of calculating uh, of counting BPS states and, and these numbers turn out to be uh, some of these numbers turn out to be related to this counting not all of them actually some of these numbers here for example this second tower here we have not identified with known BPS states in this uh, in this supersymmetric theory but we suspect that in the end they will all be related to to, to BPS some sort of BPS counting. Marcos can I just quickly ask what kind of 3D theory is 
Well, uh, you see, there is this 3D, 3D correspondence, which says that uh, given any complement of hyperbolic knot, you can construct a three dimension N equal to three dimensional super conformal field theory. So essentially, okay, so it's the five brain on the on the yes, map. exactly. Physically, this is obtained by 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 some sort of AET duality in three dimensions, and there is a very precise dictionary which, given the hyperbolic knot, it tells you exactly what is the superpotential, the field content, etc. In in the, on this superconformal field theory, and these Stokes constants, some of these Stokes constants that we found here, the Stokes numbers, are definitely counting BPS uh, states in detail. But it's, it's a normal kind of field theory, I mean, with the gauge group and super potential and global super yeah, 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 it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. not some exotic yeah. thing. No, 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 it's just, uh, yeah, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's okay. a theory that you can write down, you can do the calculations explicitly and so on. Yeah. But I what we found, that we're very surprised that, you know, this is those constants that are actually counting this. And I think this is a very highly non-trivial example of this relationship between, Don, you know, Donaldson Thomas counting and Stokes uh, problems, okay, which I think has to be elucidated a little bit a little bit better. Which observable are you actually looking at in the, you know, N equals two 3D theory, the, the 3D, 3D dual theory? Sorry, what? Which states, uh, what, what observable are you actually calculating on the gauge theory side? Oh, this is this uh, index. There is this the, the, uh, 3D the index. index. Yeah, 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 the super conformal index. But this only gives you uh, this tower here. Now, the older tower, we really don't know what it is. I mean, we know it, these are integers. And in a sense, we have to generalize the theory of the index to account for these additional towers. So, so there are there are there is one tower of Stokes constants which we actually can identify with the index. The other we cannot. So that's that's something that we still don't understand well. Okay, so. Marcus, so, is this an yes. experimental observation or is... Yes, yes, this is experimental observation, yeah. So you've checked it up to some order? Yes, yes. L let me, let me, act, let me, okay, let me, let me, to be more precise, these numbers, we have computed them numerically, like using resurgence. I mean, you, you can, of course, you don't get a minus eight, you get a minus 7.999 when you do the numerical calculation. Now, so we, we first calculated these, these numbers numerically, and then we found generating functions for them in terms of natural Q series. So we have conjectural Q series at all orders, which reproduce these numbers. Okay. So we computed maybe like the first 10 of them numerically, and then we found this Q series. And this Q series was easy to find because if you have look at this theory enough, long enough, you know what is the supersymmetric index is. But these additional integers, we had to really work very hard to find what they are. and and, and that's why we had to develop a new theory to account for but it. But it sounds like you don't have a conceptual argument why you should have discovered the superconformal index from this trans series. Not yet, not yet, not yet. I don't think that's so, uh, maybe it's not so complicated. I mean, if probably if I knew a little bit better uh, this uh, 3D theories, N equal to theories, I would, maybe I would come out with, with some good arguments. Yeah. But right okay. now I don't have a good argument. Yeah, but Marcos, but these numbers should be number of kind of instant on some product of your manifold with R with two boundary conditions, you know? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if, if you can probably interpret this as counting, yeah, as counting yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this, uh, this uh, yeah, like, like infinite dimensions, in a sense. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But we haven't developed all these kind of uh, interpretations. In a sense, what I, I find very important here is, you know, is the fact that you, you, you know, uh, that you find actually towers of singularities and an infinite number of singularities, which is something that you don't find usually in, 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 in many, um, in this sort of linear examples. And, and we're very uh, fascinated by these towers of singularities numbers and we gave them a number, we call them peacock patterns, because, you know, when you look at these, uh, at these things, they look like uh, the lines, the, the Stokes rays look like the lines, uh, like, the, like, like the feathers of a peacock. And of course, what, uh, what uh, Tom was showing us yesterday for the resolved conifold also is a peacock pattern according to our, our nomenclature. Uh, and as you will see, they will reappear later in another example. So they are not really confined to churn simons theory. They, they seem to be appearing often in, in the Borel plane of many different theories. Okay. Now, now this is an example in quantum field theory. And then you could think that, you know, 
you know, this is going to be in a sense the inner story, but let me, in quantum field theory and in string theory, but let me make two important caveats. Now, in quantum field theory, we, are, we think that, um, of course, looking at the expansion of our instantons in quantum field theory is an important source of transitives. But what is, I think, very important, and for me is one of the most important problems in this story, is that in quantum field theory, not all relevant formal power series come from instantons. I mean, the, the, uh, um, from subtle points of the path integrals. And this is something that people discover in the 70s, in a sense. And what they discover is that the non protective sector of asymptotically free theories in infinite volume cannot be explained with instantons. And this is what is called the problem of renormanos. There are sectors in asymptotically free theories in which instantons are essentially irrelevant. And I think this is really one of the most important problems. And I know here there are many people who are really half understood very well instantons, but I, I, I would say that understanding mathematically this renormal problem, it's probably one of the most important um, open problems in quantum field theory. And resurgence tells you that even if these things are not coming from semi-classical saddle points, they are going to give you still the same structure of transitives. And what is, and this is very important. Transitives, this concept of transitives is more general than the concept of instantons. Instantons are just giving you one example of transitives. And there, there is a more general, uh, there, is a more, there are more general examples of transitives which come from this renormal phenomenon. Now, in string theory, uh, uh, in the situation is in a sense worst. And the reason is that in string theory, we only know how to construct perturbative series around the trivial sector, in a sense. I mean, we, we have some ideas of how we could, uh, you know, we could, uh, what could be the source of additional sectors through the brains or main brains. But in general, we don't really know how to calculate the series. Um, more importantly, we don't really know what is the function underlying our asymptotic series. In quantum mechanics, we know, for example, that if you have you have uh, the series correspond the series in, with which I started my talk, right? The series of the associated to the ground state energy of the of the of the of, of the of the quartic potential. We know that we know what is the non perturbative object behind this series. I mean, is is the ground state energy of a Hamiltonian, which is a well defined object in quantum mechanics. But in string theory, we don't really know uh, what is the non perturbative definition of the theory. So we don't really know what is the actual function behind our perturbative series. And, and this makes things, in a sense, also more difficult. So remember that, for example, in, in the case of chern simons theory, this was very easy. What is behind our power series is actually this state integral, this partition function of chern simons theory, which can be made rigorous by using this state integral construction. But in a string theory, we don't really know what is the state integral or what is the path integral that is behind our calculations. So this makes very hard to actually make progress. So, so what I want to do today is, uh, uh, for the last part of my talk, is to tell you what I know about how to address the problem of resurgence in a simplified model of string theory, which uh, fortunately is mathematically very uh, relevant, which is topological string theory. Okay. So we don't, I cannot offer you a complete picture but I can offer you some indications of what could be the structure that is behind it. And I think this is also an interesting open problem for the future. So, so I'm going to put myself in a simple situation. So X is going to be a Calabria of threefold, and I'm going to consider the kind of easy object that you can do, uh, that, that you can deal with in, in the string theory, which is um, the generating function of gromme booting invariance of genus D. So for simplicity, I will assume that I have a, a single Keller parameter in my Calabria threefold. This is just to simplify my notation. Everything goes through in general. And uh, if, if in a topological string theory, essentially a genus G, which is corresponds to a calculation of G loops uh, in a string theory, you can, in the case of topological string theory, you know that this calculation at, 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 in, at, at G loops can be actually written when t is sufficiently large as a power series in the exponential of the Keller parameter. And the coefficients are this uh, famous gromov with invariance. So this is the gromov with invariant of genus G and degree D. Okay. And we call this the genus G free energy. And string theorists and, and have tried to calculate this quantity in many ways, for example, using mirror symmetry and so on. 
Now, one, uh, one interesting thing is that this, uh, this uh, series is actually a good series. Uh, it's known that this uh, series has a, conver has a, is a convergent series, has a finite radius of convergence around t equal to infinity. And this finite radius of convergence is very importantly independent of g. So all these fgs, hmm, there are an infinite number of fgs, g is the genus, goes from zero to one and so on. But all of these, um, all of these um, power series in e to the minus t have the same radius of convergence. And these are quite complicated functions. Uh, when you use mirror symmetry, you see that they are essentially generalized hypergeometric functions with a complicated branch cut structure and so on. And part of the complication of mirror symmetry is to actually calculate and understand these functions. Now, this is not really the kind of divergent power series that you want to consider because this series is convergent. So this defines well, this defines good functions, at least in a neighborhood of, of the large radius limit in which t is equal to infinity. But what is the physical quantity to calculate in, in string theory is the formal sum of all these objects with an additional coupling constant, which is in a sense like an H bar, which is the string coupling constant. So what we want to do in topological string theory, as we would do in string theory in general, is to sum up all these genus contributions with a coupling constant, which is the string coupling constant. Now, and this is where you, again, uh, divergence hits you because all these numbers are well defined if T is inside the convergence region that I was mentioning before. So these are, if you fix the value of t of the Keller parameter near in this convergence region, these numbers are well defined. And it turns out that as g grows, these numbers grow like 2g factorial. So also each of these functions is a well defined function near the large, near the large radius limit. This series is itself divergent. And this is where you can actually ask all the questions of resurgence. So the first question is, first of all, is there a well-defined function which has this function, this uh, asymptotic series as its asymptotic expansion? And the second question is, what is the resurgent structure of this series? And notice that, again, we are in a higher level of complexity because now the coefficients of my series depend on this scalar parameter t. So the, for each value of t, we'll have one uh, divergent series. And also notice that this diverges like 2G factorial, not like G factorial. I mean, technically, this is not very important because it's very easy to extend the theory of resurgence for an double factorial growth. Essentially, you just have to redefine your Borel transform and divide by 2G factorial instead by G factorial. So these questions are, are very important, and we don't know much about these questions. Okay, we don't know much, We don't know very. We don't really know the answer to these questions. Already, what is the resurgent structure of this series? We don't really know much about it. But let me tell you. Um, let me tell you what you could think you could try to do. Now, one thing you could try to do is to say, "Aha!" But this is Gromov-Witten theory. But that's why. We have introduced Donaldson Thomas invariance or Goma Kumar Waffen invariance. You know, this would be improved things. And it's actually true that, for example, if you express this topological string theory in terms of Goma Kumar Waffen invariance, you do a partial resummation of this series. And then what you get is a slightly different object. The total free energy, when expressed in terms of Goma Kumar Waffen invariance, has a different expression. Uh, it's still a, a, a power series in e to the minus 10. And now the coefficients depend on q, uh, and q here is e to the i over gs. Okay, so these are each term in e to the minus t. It's a it's a rational function of q. Okay, now you could think that this is going to make life easier, but this definition also has its problems. Um, one problem which I, I found very interesting is that even as a formal power series this uh, expression is not well defined when q is in the unit circle. So if q is in, is, if gs is real, so q is, is a phase, these coefficients are divergent, are not well defined due to the genus zero contribution to the, Gopa, to the Gopakumar Buff invariance or to the Nelson Thomas invariance. Um, and the fact that this series has uh, actually, you know, the coefficients cd as, as d grows have more and more Singularities. So the number of singularities grows uh, as d grows. So, so this is this is really like a very ill-defined function. And let me point out that this is exactly what happens 
to the compact dilogarithm. And we know that the compact dilogarithm is a function which has an infinite number of, of, of poles in the unit circle. And, 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 and one way to understand this function is, as, uh, is that it's missing something. And what is missing is another piece which makes the non-compact dilogarithm. And when you add this other piece, all these singularities disappear. So the fact that this function has all these singularities in the unit circle, for me, is an in, a strong indication that we are missing a full sector of the theory. So even so, using this Donaldson-Thomas invariance or Gopakumar waffen variance here is not going to solve the problems. So, so let's then go back to the resurgence story. So resurgence has a kind of very clear problem. And the first question that you could ask then is what are the singularities of the very transform? So the very transform here would be the following. You would take this sum total uh, free energy of uh, with coefficients fg of t. You would now divide by 2g factorial. You would have a um, um, uh, parameter zeta. And then you could ask, where are the singularities of this very transform? Now this function is going to, for each value of t, this function is going to be analytic in a neighborhood of the origin. And you could actually try to see where are the singularities of this world transform. And there is a strong evidence that the singularities that of this world transform are a subset of the lattice of periods of the Calabi-Yau X or the mirror Calabi-Yau. So essentially, the singularities of this world transform are at central charges of this Calabi-Yau. Uh, I have to say that this has only been studied in the case in which X is toric. X toric is, uh, or non-compact, it's a very important case. Uh, and these are the cases in which this has been studied explicitly. So, so let me just show you a picture of this. So this is a calculation for local P2 in which we used uh, 100 uh, terms of this series. So this is genus 100. And we fix a, a particular value of T and we actually look at the Borel singularities of this, of this theory. And you see that uh, the singularities, I, I have noted some of them. Um, so, so here, uh, this, um, this uh, singularity here, for example, it's located at exactly the value of t. So t is the Keller parameter. And this singularity here is located at the value df0 with respect to dt. And this green block uh, is just uh, this block plus four pi square. So you see that there is a sort of neat structure. And essentially, every singularity here is a linear com is an, is a, an integer linear combination of t, df0 with respect to t. So this is the a period of the Calabial. This is the b period. And then a constant four pi square. Okay. So this is, this is a numerical calculation, but it gives some strong evidence that the singularities are located really at periods of the Calabilla. Uh, now, uh, yes? Marcos, what do you mean by the lattice of periods? I don't know, I'm I mean, uh, if you think about, uh, if you, you could just take uh, integer linear combinations of t, df0, t, and say okay. constant okay, just, just integer two pi combinations square. Of the yeah, of integer the linear combinations. This will have give, give you a lattice in the complex plane for each value of the parameter, for each value of the Keller parameter. And then what I say is that the Borel singularities are points in this lattice. Okay. Not all of them maybe are going to be, not all of points in this lattice are going to be Borel singularities, but every Borel singularity will be a point in this lattice. So well, this- in, in general, in general, the central charge isn't going to give you a lattice, right? It's going to be, isn't going to give you It's not lattice. going to give you a lattice, maybe in this case, well, certainly in this case, but in Why general, not? some kind of dense set of complex numbers. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, well, what I mean is that just integer linear combinations of this. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. But is, is it, but then WKB even have high genus spectral curve also got everywhere dense lattices, but in each finite sheet, we've got only discrete set. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, actually, I, yeah. Thanks, Maxime, for pointing this out. Actually, this is actually exactly what you would find in WKB. In WKB, you would find that the singularities of, 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 of say, the quantum periods are exactly a subset of points in, 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 in the lattice of periods, right? So, so that's very similar. And that's why, you know, you know the, we, we know that this happens for toric alabiales, which are similar to WKB, but I, I, I'm not sure if this is going to happen, for example, for the quintic alabiales. That I'm not sure. 
But oh, actually, I have a question. In these examples, are the periods periods of spectral curve but in kind of for Q difference equations, not on differential equations? Uh, no, these are the classical periods. Uh, now here, yeah, what yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, here what yeah. I'm, yeah, no, I see what you mean. No, here I'm considering the kind of a standard topological string. I could consider yeah. the sort of the, the quantum periods of this difference equation, right? Obtained by quantizing the curve. And I would get a very similar pattern here, okay? That's absolutely, that's, I would get also the singularities at these same points. Ah. But here I'm not considering the quantum periods. I'm considering the topological string, which is different. Yeah, the, the, the quantum periods is more related to the quantization. And this is, there are like two quantizations. One is give you the standard topological string. The other gives you this quantization of the spectral curve. So, so this is the quantization corresponding to the topological, to the conventional topological string. So gromo witten theory. Now, notice that here again, we have this peak of pattern in the sense that uh, singularities arrange themselves in towers, okay? So here, uh, the difference is in the constant four pi square, but this is just a normalization issue. So, so you can see that uh, we, fi we find again this structure. And again, this, this structure seems to be typical of, uh, of, of theories which have uh, an underlying spectral curve in exponentiated variables. Mm -hmm. So this is also the case for torical avion maps. Uh, now, now, the, now, once you know that there are all these singularities, the question would be, I mean, we know from the theory of resurgence that each of these singularities should lead to a, an additional formal power series. And this is where it's not so easy to see what to do. How would you calculate the additional trans series associated to all these singularities? Because we know that by local expansion of this border transform around these singularities, we have to get other formal power series. So how would you, how would we actually calculate this additional power series? And in, in, I have to say that in topological state theory, we don't have any a priori way to do this calculation. Now, I mean, we don't have a, an integral, a path integral from which to calculate difference other points. This is a string theory. Now, there is a formal way of doing this calculation of trans series, which is uh, very interesting. It's based on this holomorphic anomaly of Versace, Chekoti, Oguri, and Bafa. So you can think about the holomorphic anomaly as a sort of differential equation for these um, uh, topological string amplitudes. And then you can try to see if there are solutions to this uh, holomorphic anomal equations involving exponentially small quantities, so additional sectors. This is actually what people do when they want to calculate uh, trans-series solutions to ordinary differential equations of linear or nonlinear. So you could do something similar to that. And, and in, in, in principle, you can do it and you can produce some trans-series, but the physical meaning of this trans-series is not very clear. But I think, in a sense, the take-home message of this study, of, of, this, uh, of this analysis is that the generating functionals that appear in enumerative geometry, in particular this um, topological string partition functions, are really the tip of the iceberg in a resurgent structure in which there are definitely infinitely many, potentially infinitely many different formal power series, which might contain very rich information about the geometry of, of these Calabrian manifolds. And we are far from understanding this structure, and in particular, we don't know, for example, what are the values of these stokes constants, but my guess would be that if you do, if you actually calculate the stokes constants for these trans series, you will actually find also integers, which are some sort of the generalized Donaldson Thomas invariants for this kind of jobs. Um, it would be very interesting to make this more concrete and to connect with other things. But, uh, you know, the example of complex change and theory suggests that this is going to be the case. Uh, now, we still, I mean, all this is just the formal resulting structure, but doesn't tell us what is the actual function behind the factorial divergence series. I mean, usually, when you have a factorial divergence series in quantum theory, you expect that there is some well-defined observable whose asymptotic expansion uh, gives you this series. Now, in, in string theory, we don't know what it is. Um, let me just point out that... Uh, that uh, there is a general conjecture in the case of Tori Calavijaus. Uh, and this conjecture, I, I think, is, is also very much in line with what you find in other examples. And what is this telling you is, is the following. Remember that all these functions of G of T are very complicated functions of the, 
of the moduli of the Calabillan. Now, uh, it turns out that behind these functions, there should be an entire function on the Calabillan moduli space. And this entire function is such that it's an asymptotic expansion when gs is small, should actually uh, reproduce this formal power series. But I actually completely convinced that there is an entire function in Calabrian model space from which function, from which this function is just an asymptotic expansion. And there is actually a, 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 a conjecture for what is this function. And um, this function, I call it here psi of kappa and gs. And this function is the Frefcon, it's a Frefcon determinant of a trace class operator. So it's by construction entire. And, and this trace class operator can be obtained by quantizing the mirror curve. Now, in the case of Tori Calabilla manifolds, the, the mirror Calabilla is, is actually reduces to an algebraic curve, which can be quantized given this different equation that Maxine was, was mentioning. And, 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 and this, this, con, this is a conjecture that this Prefond determinant has this asymptotic expansion, but has been tested in many examples. And, and I think uh, uh, this is probably a true conjecture. And let me point out that when you do this, this, this object is actually well defined for any real value of the string coupling constant GA. So this problem that we found before that you know there was this accumulation of singularities at the real values of GS also disappears. And there is some mechanism for, for doing this. So I mean, here I'm, I'm probably sketching too many things, but um, I'm not giving you a, a, a deep um, uh, explanation of all these things. But I, I think the take a home message again is that behind this um, kind of um, very complicated functions that appear in top of the theory, there is really an entire function of moduli space. And this entire function uh, has a completely different meaning. Uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's really related to a spectral theory of some non trivial operator in L to R anyway. So this is not so complicated. But this is just for the case of Tori Calabiaus. But I think uh, this should also be the case in the, in the kind of compact case. We still don't know what is this entire function, but I, I think there should be something very similar. OK, so let me finish with uh, conclusions. So, so what I like about resurgence is that this is really a universal structure. Every time you have a perturbative series, you can apply this mechanism. And you know that there will be many surprises ahead. There will be an infinite number of finite or infinite number of formal power series that you didn't know. There will be an those constants. And in a sense, resurgence, it's the closest thing to providing a unifying language for quantum physics. Because it, you, know, you can apply it in quantum mechanics, in quantum physics, and so on. And it also applies in quantum geometry and topology. And there are some examples. It's very hard to do to actually make this structure clear. But uh, when, when, when you do, when you actually solve examples, you find many interesting surprises. Uh, in the case of complex Simon's theory for hyperbolic knots, for example, we found that this is those constant give you naturally an infinite number of integer numbers, which are integer invariants of, of a hyperbolic knot. And I think it's a very interesting question to know when this happens more generally. In a sense, this is, in a sense, this is the opposite of, of what Tom I was doing. So Tom has this Donaldson-Thomas invariance, and from it, it constructs some problem which is going to reproduce this through a Stokes phenomenon. Here we start with a path integral, uh, with, uh, which we can analyze in detail. We have a natural Stokes problem, which is the universal Stokes problem associated to that resurgence associated to any perturbative expansion. And from there, we read this integer invariant. So, so I think these two points of view are, are complementary, and but I, I want really to emphasize that the resurgence point of view is really very general, and for example, it applies to all these um, complex term Simon's theory examples. Uh, what I try also to suggest at the end of uh, at the end of my talk is that uh, in the case of topological strings, there is a very similar structure. There should be a very similar structure. And I think the main message here is that all these generating functions that we like so much appearing in numerative geometry are really just the shadow of a much richer structure, which you can uncover with resurgence, but uh, it's clear that there, there are going to be there are going to be non protective sectors associated to this protective series. And as I was uh, suggesting, I think there is really a, a very rich uh, structure behind involving a master entire function which encodes all these enumerative information of Calabillao threefolds. Um, there is, I have some pro work in progress with GA Gu, my postdoc on, on topological strings, and I hope I will be able to say something a little bit more concrete about this in the near future. So thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Marcos. Are there questions, please? Marcos, I had a question about your, uh, your definition yes. of kappa. Yes. Can you go back to that. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a little bit too fast here. Yeah. Kappa, so, so, so let's see. It, it, so the, this, this is an asymptotic series. This is an asymptotic yeah. expression yeah. as GS goes to zero. Yes. But you see, does, in order does to. Does that mean that T is also going to zero? Yes. But you see, you have to, you have to, um, actually, you have to take a kappa to infinity and GS to ah, zero. So, yeah, way so that T is not six. going to zero. So yeah, it's no, no, zero. T is not going to zero. It's just that, sorry, I didn't write all the details here. This is a double scaling limit, right? It's in a okay. sort of toft limit in which. Uh, oh, okay. Kappa okay. Goes, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but actually, kappa has the meaning of, uh, of, of the of, of the modulus of the Calabilla, right? So, so, so this is really an entire function on the full modulus space. In particular, for example, in this function, there is no conifold singularity. The conifold singularity is, is resolved because it's entire. So you can see that in the in the full definition of this function, this is an asymptotic expansion, but in the full theory, there is no uh, there is no um, Singularity. And this is, you know, just to give you an example, this is exactly what happens in WKV. When you do WKV, you will find that all power, all terms in the WKV expansion are singular at the turning points. And the singularity gets worse and worse as you push the expansion. And this is what you see in topological string theory. As you, you go in genus, the singularity at the conifold gets worse and worse. But you know that in, in, in WKV, you know that the wave function is not really singular at the turning point. This is just an artifact of the expansion. So here again is the same thing. The conifold singularity should be an ar a, 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 it's an artifact singularity of this asymptotic expansion. I guess this also happens in matrix models, right? If you take absolutely, the, absolutely, which uh, ma airy matrix integral. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Very I have similar. to say that I have to say that this is also very much inspiring your paper with she and Cyber and Maldacena. Yeah, yeah, it's very out, rem reminiscent. Right, to right, where you were pointing out that the true moduli space doesn't have all these cuts and so on, but you just have like the, the complex plane, right? You were saying that you have this Riemann surface, but in the non-perturbative theory, this Riemann surface disappears and you just have a complex plane, right? So this yes, is exactly. exactly the same thing here. So you see the structure of this FD of T is a complicated Riemann surface with all these singularities, branch cuts and so on. But behind this, there is an entire function on the complex plane. So it's a cut with the same picture that you were pointing out. Cool, thanks. Okay, Marco, you have a question. Yes. Hi. No, no, Marco for Marcos. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to know, um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, a while back uh, about renormalons. So yes. uh, for, for people who, are, who don't know about them, what, what should we know about renormalons and how do they affect you know, the computation of observables in, in standard quantum field theory? Well, so, so essentially the idea is the following. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look at a quantum theory and you want to understand why the power series diverge, uh, people discover that uh, in quantum mechanics, for example, this is just due to the fact that you have more and more diagrams. And this is, the, you know, there is a factorial growth in the number of Feynman diagrams, okay? And this is what is behind this uh, uh, growth behavior in the case of instantons. So instantons are related to the growth of power, I mean, the, 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 the exponential corrections due to instantons are related to the growth of perturbation theory due to the growth in the number of diagrams. But what people found is that there are families of diagrams which do not grow factorially. I mean, there are, but what happens is that when you integrate over momenta, which is something that you have to do in, in general in quantum field theories, some peculiar diagrams uh, already by integrating over momenta, grow factorially like n factorial. So, so these are these kind of, and this is due to the fact that essentially, uh, you know, these theories uh, have um, a non-trivial renormalization group. Okay, so, so, so it, it's related to the behavior of these theories in, at very large distance, where you know that this is going to be difficult to understand um, the theory just using perturbation theory. But um, um, so, so that's why, you know, I think uh, one of the kind of, um, one of the kind of, of, of things that should be done in mathematics in the next years will be to really give a more mathematical and geometric understanding of these renormals. I mean, 
what I'm telling you is in a sense what you find in textbooks, right? Renormalons are these are a special type of diagrams that grow factorially in a way which is even faster than what instantons would tell you. Okay. And, and this is this factorial growth, which is essentially due to the to the true uh, behavior of the theory um, at, at large distances. And this is this is what is behind this renormal problem. And this does not occur in uh, quantum mechanics? No, no, in quantum mechanics, it doesn't occur. It has to occur in a non-renormalizable theory or? No, no, in a renormalizable theory, actually. Yeah, I see. It, oh, it, I see. It, occurs, it occurs in, I mean, it, not necessarily. There are examples of theories which have renormalons which are finite. But um, uh, oh, yeah, it's... Uh, Marcos, it's does, really QCD, does QCD have renormalons? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Any asymptotically free theory will have renormalons. And, 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 and these are sources of non-perturbative corrections, which are not understandable through semi-classics. So you're saying that the number of diagrams is not growing factorially, but only the... the no, no, no. The number of diagrams grow fast, grows factorially, but some of these diagrams grow even faster. I see. So, so imagine, for example, you do a calculation at 50 loops. So you will find 50 factorial diagrams. And just the fact that these diagrams you know, grow factorially already gives you a factorial growth. But you see, each diagram, you have also to calculate the, 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 quant the, the amount of each diagram. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that among these 50 factorial diagrams, there is one which already grows like 50 factorial <laughs> after you integrate, you see? You mean there is one family, one sequence? Or one sequence for each loop. So at, at, at uh, 50 loops, there is one particular diagram which is going to already be, when you evaluate, it gives you 50 factorial. I understand, okay. So imagine that you have 50 factorial diagrams and each of them, all of them contribute to one, but yes. there is one which already contributes 50 factorial. I understand, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what is going on. So instantons are telling you, aha, you have 50 factorial diagrams in your calculation, but the normals are telling you, yep, but one of these diagrams, it's already 50 factorial. So this is another source of growth which you didn't take into account just with the instantons. And somehow in the Borel plane, you have no uh, insight as to what, what, how they're represented. I mean, you, you can actually see what is the location in the Borel plane. And there are actually theories, there are actually general conjectures of what, it's, what, what is the location that they get in the, the Borel plane. This, is, this was understood already in the 70s. What is not understood is what is the calculation that you have to do in quantum field theory to actually get that transidious, right? So remember that each singularity is going to give you a series. If this, if this singularity is due to an instanton, you know, your quantum field theory textbooks tell you how to do this calculation. But if this singularity is due to a renormalon, you don't really know how to do this calculation. And I think this is really a, a fundamental open problem in quantum theory. I mean, the textbooks tell you how to do calculations in power series, but when the singularity is due to a renormalon, you don't really have a clue. You don't have a first principle way of doing this calculation in general. Marcos? Yes? In, in the example you just, you just gave to Marco? Yes. You have to know that, you know, at, at 50 loops, it's not one diagram is 50 factorial and the other diagrams are all minus one. The other 50 yeah. factorial diagrams are all minus one. Right, you have to rule that out, right? Yes, 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 but uh, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. You have to be very careful, but um, but uh, but we have. I mean, people have done calculations to actually see that uh, you know this is actually this is actually the case. I mean, in for example, in asymptotically free series which are integrable, you can calculate the power series, you know, the perturbative series up to very large order, and this is definitely the case that there is this factorial growth. And they don't interfere normal. in the way I was just suggesting. Sorry? They don't cancel each other in the way I was No, saying. no, no, no. The total result is, is actually this 50 factorial, which actually overrules the 50 factorial coming from all the other diagrams. It sounds like, I mean, the way you presented it, it sounds kind of extremely difficult problem. I mean, kind of almost Absolutely. hopeless. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's one of the more important open problems in formal quantum field theory. Do, just offhand, um, in case you have looked for this stuff, but um, have these been seen in lattice gauge theory, like lattice QCD? Well, the thing is that uh, the thing is that these are artifacts of perturbation theory. You see, 
Um, in a sense, renormalons, only if you do perturbation theory, these objects are there. This doesn't mean that they are not there. I mean, they actually, they, you can actually use these renormalons to actually calculate, do ca non perturbative calculations. But, um, but in lattice gauge theory, um, but in a sense, they are artifacts of perturbation theory. It's only when you when you decide that you are going to do your calculation using perturbation theory that this that these renormals are going to be there. And in a non perturbative calculation, they are mixed up with everything. You see, in a non perturbative yeah, calculation, you you know you have but the perturbative and the non perturbative calculations mixed together in in the single number. It's only when you the this number you decide to divide it into something perturbative plus something non perturbative that these renormals play a role. In a lattice calculation, they are all mixed up together. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Are there any other questions? So Marco, you still have, or you again have your hand up? Yeah, could I have, could I ask a follow-up question? So yes. Why yes. Is are there any other questions, just in case someone else has not lifted their hand and would like to ask a question? No, then Marco, go ahead. I'm just wondering that why in all these cases are Gevray 1 series, are the, why are they the ones that show up? Why is it always Gevray 1 rather than higher Gevray series? Well, there is Gevray 2, right? In, 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 in the topological theory. Strings. Or, or in, actually, in WKV, is the Gevray 2, is 2M factorial, right? Already. Now, the question is why you don't have something worse? WKB, like in, in usual quantum mechanics. Yeah, in the usual quantum mechanics, is, is Gevray 2. The, 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 the WKB expansion uh, diverges like 2n factorial. In h bar? In h bar, yeah. Uh, you in mean the quantum, for this the quartic quantum quartic period? Quartic. Sorry? You, you, are you referring specifically to this quartic? Uh, quartic uh, no, no, it's a, generic, uh, it's a generic fact, say, uh, any polynomial potential in quantum mechanics, the, the quantum periods uh, that you, for example, uh -huh. you want to do bohr sommerfeld quantization at all orders, this will grow like two n factorial. Okay, okay. Already. But you know, I, I think the reason why, you know, I think what the reason why you only have n factorial and two n factorial behavior is because of because of polynomiality of your of your of your action. Of your Lagrangian, right? Of your action. Uh, there are something which there are there are some perturbations which are called super singular perturbations of of I'll uh, say of the harmonic oscillator in which you could have a much uh, faster divergence of the perturbative series. I see. I no, but Marcos, really Marcos. Yeah. But I think yes. Marco is asking, uh, like, why is it growing like n factorial, whatever, two n factorial, rather than n factorial to some power? Yeah, know, yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. But I think this is, I think this is, well, n factorial to some power is like uh, n fact, you know, well, it's like n factorial squared is like two n factorial. But, uh, but uh, you could, oh, that's what you meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I mean, you could have two n factorial, and um, you know, in I think in realistic examples, you just have n factorial or two n factorial. But I think this is, as I said, this is related to the fact that you know the algebraically of the, I mean, the fact that the Lagrangian is polynomial okay, thank in you. the fields. So you have a question, and I think we should then close the session. But yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Marcos. Hi. Um, so I was wondering concerning uh, your statements about the topological string. I mean, in some cases, uh, so we're in the toric world. Um, of course, we can compute uh, topological string partition functions by topological vertex. So, of course, uh, what you say is uh, that you have uh, a non-perturbative completion of a sort, but um, in any case, I think the question is allowed what the relation is between what one can compute from the topological vertex to the function that you define. So yeah, yeah, was yeah. this analyzed? Well, this is, in... Yeah, yeah, this is what I said before. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, an asymptotic expansion of this function, right? No, 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 so no. This... I mean, in some cases, uh, what you compute from the topological vertex uh, actually does make sense as a function of uh, uh, the h bar parameter and the Kähler parameters, right? So sometimes it just convert mm. it produces convergent series. No, no, uh, not for well. Me. Yes, I it mean... does. It's a it's a theorem of Felder and the students. Yeah, uh, but this that, is for that, four D cases. This is for 4D no, 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 cases. no, no. I'm in five D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, I mean, in in the 4D case, they yes. couldn't make such a theorem, but for the 5D right. case, they have it, right? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think, uh, 
for example, for local P2, you cannot do that, right? I think that you can do that when you have like some sort of like, uh, you can do geometric engineering, uh, you know, starting with a 5D gauge theory. But for example, for local P2, I don't think uh, this is the case. I mean, the um, result covers the case, which would be sort of the 5D uplift of the Sayo Witness yeah, or the F. Uh, right, right. The, exactly. The, but this, for example, doesn't, this doesn't cover local P2, for example. In local P2, you cannot play much with that. Now, it's true that, for example, you do local P1 and P1, which is an uplift of cyber Witten, then you can do some sort of partial resumation in which the theories is, the series is convergent for complex H bar, for complex GS. But this problem that I was mentioning of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of this uh, um, dense set of poles is still there. So when, yeah, I mean, of when course, this would, would hold for the case where what you call GS is uh, purely imaginary, right? So in that oh, case, yeah, yeah, or real, yeah, yeah. In that case, you have this uh, singular, you know, I, in that case, you have these singularities. So on one hand, this doesn't cover all cases. And on the other hand, you have these singularities, which uh, make, um, for example, make it, make it difficult, make it impossible to actually, you know, calculate, for example, in the cases in which you want to relate this to a spectrum of integrable systems, this actually is an obstruction to do that, right? Because in that case, H bar is real, so. Yeah, but I mean, still, I think it creates a puzzling situation, right? Because you have to find a function for some values of the complex Q plane, and you have another definition of a function for other values of the complex Q plane. So mm -hmm. I think uh, it is a valid question to ask uh, how they are related and uh, if somehow sure. there is some analytic object sure. maybe uh, unified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, I, I could so do something uh, even, even simpler, right? I could just yeah. do Borel resumation of, of, of this series, right? I could do a Borel resumation of this series and it turns out that, you know, in many cases, this series is Borel resumable. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, the, in some direction, right? So this also gives me a non-perturbative object, at least for some values of yes in some angles in the complex plane. So for example, you look at this, at this pattern here, you see there is no obstruction to Borel resumation on the real line. So this means that you could actually for, you know, you could do a Borel resumation of this, of this object, right? But um, uh, yeah, so, so, so there are many, it's clear that there is, there are many possible, topo, uh, you know, um, non productive objects that could be proposed, um, which are all, you know, in principle, you don't have any way to distinguish in between them, right? But I think the fact that you get an entire function on the, on the moduli space, I think that's probably something that can only, be, can only happen for this, uh, for this definition that I was proposing here, right? Because uh, in that case, you have this relation to a spectral problem in, in in trace in a spectral theory, and this is where you get something which is absolute an entire function. But I agree with you that in some cases you might have other functions which are still well defined, at least as functions yeah. of some parameters, right? I guess what I would suggest is uh, that ultimately, but that's probably really the matter for a longer discussion some other time. Um, one should look for some object uh, which unifies uh, these different cases uh, and has some interesting analytic structure uh, with respect to GS as sort of is, um, well, what we have for, for 4D, but of course the 5D case is in some respects um, different. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think this definition is actually good because it's also like, it, it predicts you something, right? It tells you how to calculate a threshold determinant, which is something that yeah. you know, in spectral theory, you don't know. This has a non-trivial content because this is equating two things which are very different, right? So this is a really a conjecture. I mean, it's not something that, uh, but of course, you know, you can, um, you can get, uh, you know, I agree that, you know, that there might be other definitions. I think, however, that this idea that there is an entire function behind is actually, in a sense, that when Witten was talking about, you know, topological strings of wave, as wave functions, I think this is exactly what was, what is the implication of that, right? That there should be some sort of entire well, function of the Calabria model space, which... Uh, 
I mean, what what Joanna is going to argue on Friday is that there is something uh, at least as natural, right? Because if indeed you have in mind this quantum mechanical uh, interpretation, then in fact uh, it can very well be that uh, uh, yeah, you have something. Well, that for example, rather than having entire function, you're going to have a section of a line bundle with transition functions. Um, representing, say, changes of coordinates on uh, the space that we're at, which would be the space of complex structures, say. So there is something very naturally, uh, very uh, natural geometric that one can uh, define along these lines. And as a matter of fact, uh, I would, I, I, I still feel very much tempted to look for the 5D analog of that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, I think uh, entire. I mean, be, the function being entire, I think, is in a sense that's what actually. Uh, that's what I said, you know, this was what uh, also the word by, word by, by Greg was suggesting, right? I think a non perturbative definition, you know, essentially you, you shouldn't find really transition functions or anything. You should some, find even something even simpler. And this is what okay. they found in, in non perturbative gravity. And I think this is the natural setting here. I think we should yeah. have this discussion on Friday. Absolutely. <laughs> After we had Joanna's talk also. Sure, um, sure, sure. And also, I think Robert has pointed out we are running very much over time. So we have, let's thank Marcus again for this fantastic talk. And we reconvene in, well, I don't know, one hour and 15 minutes. So at eight o'clock, actually much less now, almost just one hour um, 